My name is Uhuru Mufukeng and welcome to the South African Book Review Sessions, your online political book club where everything political literature is dissected, vivisected and eviscerated. Guys, we're doing something, we're doing a book that really, 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 really got me angry. <laughs> a book really got me angry. And I, I don't believe I've done a book that I will criticize so much like the book I'm about to do today. Like one book that has received so much criticism from me, it's um, Stellenbosch Mafia by uh, Peter Tutot. I don't like this book and it's no secret. But then compared to the book I'm gonna do today, this is nothing. This is absolutely nothing. So guys, uh, if you're new here, there's a subscribe button on the bottom of your screen. Go ahead, hit on that subscribe button as quickly as possible. Two advantages to it. It comes at absolutely no extra cost. You're not going to incur any extra cost by clicking on that subscribe button. Secondly, by clicking on that subscribe button, you're making sure that you don't miss out on any content coming from this channel. So let's get into the depth, to this damn book. It's a book by Fervut. Uh, it's a book by Henry Kenny about Fervut, the architect of apartheid. Die, guys, man. Mm -mm. No, this book should not be sold. No flipping ways. Okay, fine. Um, <clears throat> it's a book by Henry Kenny, uh, uh, Fervour, the architect of apartheid. It's some sort. It's not really an official biography, but it's some sort of biography. It tells us about Fervour, his impact on South Africa, and it goes and gives us a lot of biographical details which we're not really interested in. But then it says uh, so much, and sometimes it says nothing at all. In you guys, fine. Um, first biographical fact that I really want us to engage. I'm not really interested in biographical facts. But then the most important biographical fact is that Hendrik Fervoort was not born in South Africa. Hendrik Fervoort is a foreigner. He was born in Holland. He was born in the Netherlands. He arrived here as a two-year-old. He didn't even stay. He stayed just a couple of years and left with his family to, for, for, for Rhodesia, came back as a teenager, finished his matric, yeah, yeah, and, and all of those things. And he went to Stellenbosch, that's important. He went to Stellenbosch, he studied psychology, finished his master's there. He studied his undergraduate, postgraduate, did his up to master's level. Eventually, where he chose, he was given a scholarship to go study in Oxford. He opted for a scholarship that had little benefits but then because it was it allowed him to study in germany so he took that scholarship he did not like english people and according to this author that is because the english and the anglo boer and all of those things so he didn't really like the english <clears throat> now done with that that's that's important for me because i con don't consider this man south african i basically was born between the Libombo and the Nsigazi Mountains in Pumalanga. I was born in the valleys of the Crocodile River. I am a South African. I am a proper South African. I am a son of the soil. And he is not. He's not. No, he's not. So he's the type of Hitler. Hitler was not German, but he tried to be more German than the Germans. He was not Afrikaner. He was Dutch. And he tried to be more Afrikaner than the Afrikaners themselves. So that's important. We had to discuss that. Now, moving on. From, from Germany, he came back, worked in, in, at the University of Stellenbosch as the head of psychology. From there, he was given a post as an, as an editor of a newspaper called the Transfaller, which was basically a nationalist newspaper during the United Party reign of Jan Smarts and 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 Herzog back in the in those days. Now <clears throat> he ran that machinery even during the Second World War. His newspaper was accused of being a mouthpiece, a mouthpiece for the Nazis. It was accused of being a spokesperson for the Germans. And some newspapers actually printed that. I think it was a rent daily mail wrote about that. He decided to sue them, went to court. The court decided, nah, man, this guy's are correct. Yes, your newspaper was there as an African newspaper, but chief, no, you propagated the views of the Nazis and the Germans. So no, we dismiss your application with cost. So the court, the court 
of the South African Court of Law discovered that the transfer under the leadership of Fervut was the mouthpiece of Nazi Germany during the Second World War. Your Fervut. Now we move on. Another important thing about Fervut is um, he stayed there, became the editor, ran those things, and eventually decided. It, eventually, he ventured into politics through using the poor white problems and the Carnegie Institute and the commission that it called the Poor Whites Commission. And he was very vocal for the poor whites. It was he who suggested that, you know what, this thing can be solved very simple. Take away the jobs of the blacks and give it to Africaners. And that's what happened. That is what happened. So this man was basically racist with every fiber of his body. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> now, um, why, after being the editor of the Transfiler and after uh, propagating the views of the Afrikaners so effectively and so influentially using the Afrikaner standards, he became he contested elections in, in, in 1948 as a candidate in one of those districts and he was cloppered. He was cloppered, you know, was thoroughly cloppered and instead he was given a position a seat in the senate he became a senator for um a while but during his time as a senator two years into his into his term as into his two years into his first term as a senator he was uh appointed into the cabinet as a minister of native affairs hey guys and you see black people had problems had problems by then like the state was already racist but then yo this blacks by then the natives had no no idea of what was to come when this man became a minister of native affairs he did three things three things that will affect us as black people and south africa in general for a very 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 long time now this is what he came up with he is the one who proposed the forceful removals from the from the townships from the olden townships, so fire towns or district nines, and and in in, in the case of of Nelspruit, your Mbombela, the original Mbombela, the township there, just in the, just in, next to Nelspruit, the forceful removals. He was the one who initiated it. He fought, he saw it, and he saw it through as a minister of native affairs. Now, secondly, he's the very same person who oversaw um, the the implementation of a uh, separate development, the, the ideology of separate development. This is the man who gave it life. The idea of Bantu stands, the idea of Bantu stands were unexistent up until Fairwood got to the spotlight as Minister of Native Affairs. He eventually gave it more life as a Prime Minister, but then the idea of a Bantu stand was basically the thinking of Fervur. Secondly, thirdly, the implementation or the idea and the implementation of Bantu education. And funny, this author Henry Kenny believes that those were significant achievements. He says that those were significant achievements. That this is what uh, Fervut achieved as Minister of Native Affairs. Like we should applaud him for that nonsense. South Africa is faced with a serious, serious polarization problem. And we can trace some of these things back to Fervut. The development of townships as a deadbeds and, and, and as, a, as overpopulated areas which are prone to disease, which are prone to unemployment and crime. Those are the outcomes of fervour thinking. And this Henry Kenny chap says, we must applaud fervour for that. Yeah, the white man can do that, not us. The black man can't do that. This man caused a lot of problems. Actually, even the white man's not supposed to do that. It's not even supposed to do that because the problems of human settlement in our country we, we subsequently, di directly and indirectly, affects them. Now, this this Henry Kenny chap wants us to applaud Henry Fairwood for ban for 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 Bantu stands, Bantu stands saying that this is, was the first time a black person was given political power in their own land and it was better than nothing. Who told you that it was better than nothing? 
Like who told you that it was better than nothing? You, you chaps caught us here and you fought us and you dispossessed us of our land. We were enjoying full political power in our land. And basically, that thing was not even political power. Micromanagement in that particular form, it was actually paternalism because Fervut saw himself as the father of these Bantustans and the Bantustan leaders as African leaders were, were, were his children. So we were supposed to be grateful for such a right-wing racist paternalism no man this man now fine let's give let's give henry kenny the author a benefit of the doubt <clears throat> why do we do that because this book was written before 1980 obviously but it was published in 1980 and you can think of a south africa in 1980 yeah a man called porter was in charge had been it was the second year in power <laughs> And that was the beginning of a very bloody decade. Literally very bloody, a very violent decade. So the government had many laws that could censor books. That could So let's say he wrote this book to be a bit pro-government because he had the fear of banishing, of his book being banished. He feared the, gallet, the guillotine of banishment. You can just say that. You can assume and give him the benefit of the doubt. Because definitely, this book is written from a perspective which basically undermines the African. And in 1980, it was, it was basically... It was, a, it was not a bad thing to undermine Africans, but it was a horrible thing to actually speak up against apartheid, against its evils, and speak up against um, the state itself. So basically, that's why he could use, he's, a, he's an English-speaking chap, obviously, Henry Kenny, that's very English. So he could, you know, use his liberal background to criticize it here but then the criticism had to be soft so let's just give him the benefit of the doubt with that now he writes about that and he tells us that the biggest achievement of fervood in the light of the Afrikaners was the establishment of a republic when he called a referendum in 1960 and he won it by a very slim margin and in 1961 decided you know what we're going for a republic and the republic of south africa was born and the monarchy was replaced with a state a very ceremonial state president who the first one was cr swart uh, but the main man was still very much him so he says that was good yeah maybe but still We've got nothing to celebrate as Africans from that. Like, absolutely nothing to celebrate from that. Like, he developed an African Republic, which did not recognize us. So to us, the monarchy, it was the same thing. It was the same thing because no one really gave us any assistance or gave us any attention. Basically, it was a coalition of capitalist and political interest of a, the fairer skin against us. And, and so this Republic thing does not benefit us. And to me, I don't see that as an achievement. Like, my forefathers never benefited from that. No, like, no African benefited from that. So, yeah. And <clears throat> he speaks also of, of he's, he's very, very passionate about Fairwood, basically, Henry Kenny. Uh, he tries hide it, but then there are few things he loves about Fairfoot. As I've mentioned, he mentions the, those three achievements while Minister of Native Affairs. He mentions the Republic. He mentions uh, how the international relations, the fallout with the Commonwealth, with, with the British, and, 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 and so forth. He speaks of that and how he handled that. And he says his international relations was, 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 was above power like was very much up to standard so he praised sings fervood he speaks of in many times he speaks of how under fervood south africa grew economically and experienced the post-war boom and all of these other things and and he puts a lot of economics he's very good in that he puts a lot of economics in that like puts data economics but I still feel like he's an apartheid apologist and I still feel like he's an, as an admirer of Fervut and as such, it becomes a big problem to be uh, impartial of this. He's very partial. Now, besides that, another thing, when, when he goes on, he speaks very ill of the black nationalist movement of 
those particular days more especially pre the mkonto we days pre 1960 he says basically nation the black nationalists were were unexistent they were ineffective they were a small group they just didn't have the desired effect they just you know they were not they were not a factor according to him uh the pac and the african national congress were not a factor to fair vote according to the author they were not a factor to fair vote the big question i then ask if those were not a factor then why did he ban them it was fair vote's government that banned the anc and the pac and he banned them for a particular cause definitely that they were nuisance they were bothering him one way or another and i don't believe that he has stressed that point enough well he gives a lot of credit to the ANC, to Mkonto Wesizwe basically, and 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 a bit of Apla, and but he speaks very ill of Poco. He says Poco, no, it was out of order, and but yeah, so I feel like also he relies, uh, the author relies a lot on 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 government on, on the government narrative of those particular days. For example, uh, this man got shot. This fair food chap, uh, this fair food chap, got shot. I think in 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 1960 again. He got shot after after Sharpville. He got shot twice in the head, and the government decided that you know what we should not. They could not perceive. They could not. They did. They could not perceive the man who shot uh, David uh, uh, fair food, uh, David Pratt as a radical political individual, and they decided to say he was insane. And a few months later, they it was it was not really arrested. Was taken to a, a, a psychological institution, a psychiatric a psychiatric institution, and he committed suicide. Committed suicide. And but basically, people the, the media of the the media the liberal media of those days were very skeptical of the narrative, and they provided a lot of evidence that basically that was murder he was murdered instead of being uh committed but then he uses that that this man was insane you know like he was an insane man who shot. like okay fine the first one that was the first person shot him twice in the head the man recovered um a couple of years later six years later in fact six years later another man a messenger stabs him to death and then the government decides again that the man is insane like everyone who has done harm to fair vote is insane like every man, and he uses that narrative. He could have done proper research on the issue of Dimitri's offenders. By that time, the information was available to him. Um, Henny van, Henny van der, General, who's the General Henny van der Meve had fallen. Uh, and, 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 and John Foster had fallen because of, 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 of that particular um scandal of of the 1970 of 1978 of the citizen so there was information available no one was hiding this information when he wrote the book he could have accessed the information but then he did access some of this information but then he was very selective he was very selective in the usage of the information so he relied solely on the narrative of the government he did not want to bother the government so he used a lot of the narrative and i'm uncomfortable with that because that's a proper distortion of history david pratt was not crazy nor was Dimitri's offenders both of them had political intentions in their harming of this fair food chap and i it's a criticism a criticism i have for this book and for the author another thing i have a criticism for is his anti-leftist stance he's so intolerant is so intolerant of the views of the left like he has a whole chapter of apartheid and capitalism he tries very hard and for me he fails he fails like he tries with that with, like with poor attempts and poor results he tries to convince all of us that apartheid was not beneficiary for the capitalist like capitalist there's no way capitalists benefited from that like it caused more like yes it would have caused some particular harm to capitalists and he uses the case in point that is being used by of rupert Johan rupert in this particular case he uses the case of Johan rupert and how basically he became a nemesis and an arch enemy to 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 fair food and basically how his business could not flourish in like ah, really Johan rupert a direct product 
of apartheid rule, like the shining star of African nationalism. Yes, you turn their backs against them, but then at the end of the day, whatever empire he had, the Rembrandt was founded under apartheid principles. So we must leave us alone. So those arguments, I am not really impressed. But besides that, how do I rate this book between from zero to ten, guys? I'd rate this book a horrible four, like a four. Yeah, four man. It's a horrible book. I've I've mentioned a number of reasons why I don't like this book. It's it's it, the author is pro apartheid and sympathetic and an apartheid apologist and admirer of fervour. And to me, fervour, as Dimitri Zafendas would say, he's the best student of Hitler. And because of his, he proves himself that he loved Hitler. He had so much. I man, guys, this is a horrible book. This. This is a book where you learn and you read and you find attitudes of whiteness. What you saw yesterday that was happening at Brackenfell or whatever that high school was in the Western Cape, where the EFF and, and, and the whites were fight when the whites moored the EFF, is basically fervourdism. Actually, there's a stage where Wood wanted to drive away all blacks from the Western Cape. So even this one wants to see today. It's an it's for Buddhism. Should not find expression in modern day democratic South Africa under the leadership of the mighty African National Congress. That should never happen over our dead bodies. But in, in short, it's a book that you should read so you can understand white attitudes, so you can understand the racism, the inherent racism within them. They say it's culture. And today, how can they change? There's, they'd always be racist. This book is a horrible book. Uh, get it, read it, but Guys, read it with the understanding, knowing that it is not meant for you. It is written from the perspective of the white man, a white English liberal perspective for that matter. Thank you for joining me. I enjoyed doing this.